Welcome. Another episode of Dr. James Beckett Sports Card Insights here with Rich Klein. We're going to deal with a couple of Hall of Fame center fielders who have some things in common. Uh, they're probably both worthy of their own show, but it's just kind of interesting when I'm thinking about this that uh, putting a couple guys together gives a little chance to compare and, contra- and contrast. And who better do that with than, uh, than Rich Klein, my good friend? So, first, thanks, sponsors Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions as well as Tops, Panini, and Upper Deck. The two center fielders, Earl Averill, uh, uh, 10 years older probably than Richie Ashburn, who He's, also is probably... I think, I think Earl is significantly older. I think it's closer to 15 to 20. Okay. He, can, he has uh, PCL cards in the 20s. Right, So it's, and Richie okay. Ashburn doesn't come up to 48. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So 15 to 20 years older. And what's interesting about them is they're both what we'll call second tier Hall of Famers. Well, they didn't get in right away. They didn't get in right away, but they're both worthy of being in the Hall of Fame. Earl Averill got one of the very first hobby pushes to get in the Hall of Fame. I believe his name is Steve Mitchell out of, I think it was Oregon or Washington. Sports Scoop. Sports yes. Scoop, one of the original hobby publications that kind of started out. That was, if not the ulterior motive, <laughs> the stated motive to, to get Earl Averill in the, in the Hall of Fame. And uh, he just didn't have a... Again, some of those PCL guys didn't, um, you know, they, some of their prime years were, were not stuck in the PCL because it was a very strong league in those days. Uh, but, but so his career was shortened because he got to the majors. Uh, you know, nowadays he would have had another two or three years and then consequently greater uh, statistics, but, but a good fielder, fast, good hitter. But when the biggest thing about early April's career is that he hit the line drive that broke Dizzy Dean's toe and purportedly created the change in pitching motion that deadened his arm, when that's what you're most famous for, that's not exactly a sparkling baseball memory. Well, it's not fair. It's not yes. fair to the man. The other thing that he should be not uh, accused of is having, I guess, a son who, uh, son or grandson? Son, who, early Earl Jr. Well, okay, so it's son who was not, not a great... <laughs> Not a great big leaguer. I mean, he made it to the show. He had a five, six-year career. He had 20 homers for the 61 Angels when everybody on the 61 Angels was hitting 20 homers because Wrigley Field is such a small field. Right. They did the home run derby that you see on TV, and they made the card set about from that very place where the Angels played their, their first meeting. You know, the L.A. Wrigley Field. Yes, the L.A. Wrigley Field. We should specify that, yes. And then uh, Richie Ashburn, uh, I'm not saying he had zero career homers, but he, he, was, he was not a power hitter at all. No, but he was fast. He covered a ton of ground in the outfield. I mean, I think he had over 500 putouts two or three years, which is just a phenomenal number, which shows just how good of a defender he was and how much he, he caught. You know, one, you know, he's the, a really good example of not counting just how many all-star games somebody was in as a measure of how good they were because he was clearly not the best or second best center fielder in the National League in the 50s. And so it wasn't his fault that he came up with Mays and Snyder and uh, for sure those guys. Yeah. And then, you know, by the end of his career, you know, one of my, you know, when we talked about doing Ashburn before, I, you know, I started thinking, I realized I met Ashburn at a show in New Jersey like 30 some odd years ago. And Ashburn was really funny, really witty, but he knew all the trivia about his career. And I didn't even care for the rest of the show about selling cards. We were having too much fun bantering trivia back and forth. I had more fun doing that than I probably would have sold the 50 extra dollars I would have sold at my table that day. Do you think that's what made him a, a good announcer? I think that he, I think he enjoyed what he was doing. I think that's one of the whole keys to announcing. I'm a big radio air check listener guy. And one of my friends many years ago sent me a radio disc jockey named Norman Knight, who's one of the original CBS FM disc jockeys. And he sent me the final show he did the first time he was in New York. And I was listening to it and I emailed him back. I said, Norm's having fun doing this. And one of the things was that that was the first time I actually heard him have fun on the radio. And I'm thinking, now, if he'd only had that fun, he, we'd respect him a lot more than we did in New York at the time. You could tell when Richie Ashford did the Phillies games, he was having fun. And, and there's something about fun when you're announcing, you know, you're being serious about the game. But if you go off on a tangent for 10 minutes, it's a long season, it's a long baseball game, and you're having fun talking about something, go at it. Well, you can get away with that in baseball. I'm thinking basketball, another play coming, football, another play coming, but baseball has some has some you know stoppages what about um richie ashburn's cards you know is is uh, 49 bowman i think it's a high number that's by far uh, that's a tough card the key card but it's not super expensive compared to its rarity i don't think no it's not and then when you get to the end of his career you know especially during those last few years before he goes to the mets like the 59 60 61 era where he's i think he's with the cubs, and cubs 60, yeah 
you could probably still, you know, we were talking about that. We talked about dollar boxes sometimes. You can probably still find ghost cards in dollar boxes. Well, it's a, so one of the, uh, forget who it was now, but it asked to do, wanted me to do an episode about semi stars. And uh, that was, you know, more important back. Well, if you don't have the annual price guide where everything is priced or the OPG where everything is priced, if you're just looking at, a, at like the magazine pricing where, where only the, the stars, then uh, Richie Ashburn could go from being a, he's not a superstar. He's maybe not even a star. He's a semi-star. And like you said, he could find himself in the, in, in a common, you know, group of uh, 59, 60, 61 tops when he's, again, maybe, maybe it kicked in a little bit more when he was on the Mets, but when he wasn't on the Phillies, you know, those are probably lower demand cards for, for yeah. a Hall of Famer. It's one of these things, if you see a lot that says 250, 61 cards, and including, including Hall of Famers. Yeah. Right. Well, Jasper, I believe, is a very low number card in 61. I think he's a first or second series yeah. card. Yeah. And so it's easy to find Richie Ashburn's to put into a lot like that. And you're right. The semi-stars are, you know, that's a way for a collector to build a set economically. You should, you know, most of the time, if you buy the key card first, you'll be better off financially. But sometimes you just want to get the bulk of the set done. And that's a great way to get a bulk of the set done. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, what about the, any regional interest in uh, in in Richie Ashburn? I mean, well, we talked about uh, Averill had this uh, really strong contingent of what uh, Seattle or wherever they were from. I think the Earl is nominish or whatever you pronounce oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a suburb of Seattle. Or yes, it's a suburb of Seattle. So you know, he was huge in the Seattle area, which uh, Richie Ashburn was big in New York and Philly. Yeah. When I was a dealer in the seventies and eighties, mostly the eighties, but I did do a couple, and I was active in the hobby in the late seventies. Ashburn was huge. He was the Phillies announcer. He's an original Met. I mean, he clicked many boxes in those days, you know, to be probably more popular on the East Coast than he would be in the Midwest. Would he be, what, what would his status be in the new era of uh, not collecting, but it applies to collecting, of uh, baseball with such an exaggerated emphasis on the long ball? He probably would be like, not as good, but he'd be an Ichiro Suzuki type player. You know, the, the one guy you have that, that hits, steals bases it's on base yeah. you know fields well i believe he threw fairly well so he's the one guy that would be like an each row suzuki type you know i mean throw more yeah. of was in baseball yeah i mean each row's each row i mean he's a unique talent but we need more players like richie ashburn yeah. and i'm not convinced that a contrarian gm might not get a couple of those guys to to spark a team instead of just waiting for the long ball to make even extra pressure on pitchers to make them throw more pitches well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, like I said, the the uh, I got if the the advanced metrics of of uh, getting on base and all that stuff, but still, hobby love doesn't come to guys. I mean, Ichiro s still had surprising power and had a marvelous arm, and so and it was a a, a multicultural uh, draw and talent. And Ashburn multicultural was New York and Philly. <laughs> and early April was Cleveland and Seattle. <laughs> Seattle. And uh, again, I think Earl Averill, in spite of his his best years, were you know he had, I, I you know I'm thinking, ten years or less that he was that he was uh, really a star, uh, and then he probably got caught World War II ish, you know. Right. Of. I believe his. I believe at one point he was the first Hall of Famer to hit a homer in his first major league at bat in 1929. Yeah. yeah. You know, so Earl Averill had about a 13, 14 year window where he was a major league, and then World War II came, and his age, and that was it for his career. And he's got a lot of cards in the 30s. You can buy early April cards at reasonable prices. And if you're willing for what they call collector grades, you can probably build a pretty impressive early April collection without destroying your financial budget. Yeah, I had a, what was it, a, a Z-Nut, you know, Z-Nut PCL pre-rookie of his. And I, I had uh, I tried to sell it and I just really didn't have a lot of interest. And that, to me, that's the definition of a, of a lesser Hall of Famer when you're, you have a chance. This was a few years ago, obviously, but... Uh, so I mean that's a that's a tough card, and again we will probably have to do an episode about what is collectible condition, and it depends on what set you're talking about. If you're talking about these Z nuts and these other very obscure cards from before World War II, uh, when you find them in a in a lesser condition, at least you found them. So and Ashburn is you know probably not. I'm trying to think if he has any condition sensitive cards. Not, not super. I mean, 49 Bowman high number is probably reasonably tough because it's a you know, a small card and all that, but, you know, obviously the, the 52s, 53s, large size cards have their condition issues just because of how they were handled, but he does, he doesn't have anything really infamous for being off centered or for being, right. you know, number one in a set or anything like that. He's more, 
he's more just it, it is what it is with him and you can find his cards and again it won't it won't destroy your budget it won't bust your budget and you'll have a nice and you can build a really nice hall of fame collection and remember one of the sad things with aspirin if i remember he was supposed to sign autographs in 97 stars they were doing rookie reprints of hall of famers and he was one of the 15 players in the set and he passed before he got to sign the cards that they were going to put his autographs in that set so he actually just missed being a certain, you know, one of the first certified autographs of Hall of Famers. Who's got a better, a, a stronger following, Earl Averill? I think Ashburn. it's Ricky Ashburn you, because he's a, a little more current, and Earl Averill's almost lost to ancient history at this point. But you, you still have enough people. If you listen to Phillies games in the '90s, you're now probably you remember Richie Ashburn, and so you've got a generation or two left of people who actually remember something about Richie Ashburn. <laughs> I don't know that this should apply to card values, but it might because I think card collectors are very um, optimistic about uh, really looking at players at their best. But Richie Ashburn at his best versus Earl Averill at his best. If you're a general manager, which one I, I would I would take Earl Averill. You probably take Earl Averill because he has that extra power component. More power, right? And but, you know, the the you play, play, you know, down here in Texas. At the old ballpark in Arlington, are now called Globe Life Field, with the center field the way it was and the way Richie Ashburn could cover ground, you might say, at that place, we have enough power. We'll take Richie Ashburn because he'll catch all these balls that not everybody catches. So you might just, in that, you know, in that situation, you might take... Situational. Okay. Yes. But again, I think we'd be remiss in not, <laughs> not reminding collectors they already know. I, I think there potentially are some, uh, perhaps contrary in kind of view in that, in that uh, like I said, the, the singles hitters, the stolen base guys are not in vogue as much now, but uh, Richie Ashburn was a great player and uh, definitely worthy of collecting interest. I'm not aware of that many people that are, that are uh, uh, super collectors for either one of those guys, but both had great careers and are uh, certainly worthy Hall of Famers. But, you know, you, how do you like to be compared to Willie Mays in the National League and Mickey Mantle in the American League? You know, you I mean, you're, you're not going to win that one. <laughs> you just you're 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 not going to be top of mind even when you're a great player. So, so he did a couple of batting titles. He had three fifty in the yeah. 1950s. I mean, he has a lot of positives. Right, and that's what makes the hobby interesting. And you know, I did that episode with Joe Davis about the ripple effect. I mean, basically, with the, the rising tide, when when one guy goes up, then you do comparative. Well, if he's more, then maybe this other guy is is uh, lagging that, but still, still of interest. So both those guys are, are hall of famers worthy of, uh, worthy of interest. They're both on my wall, you know, in my wall of, of uh, fame where I show uh, some of the best players in the, in the different sports. But uh, anyway, that's enough for today, Rich. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks listeners. Wouldn't, we clearly wouldn't do it if we didn't have any listeners. Uh, actually we would do it. Rich and I would still talk about stuff occasionally. And um, uh, again, thanks Rich for your contributions to the, uh, not just to the podcast, but to the industry. And thanks, listeners. I will be back again tomorrow with another episode. Really enjoying this. Thanks again. The man in-